The text for the sermon this morning is Acts 13, verse 48, the last part of verse 48. These few words, and as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are well aware of the historical context. This is Paul's first missionary journey. He was commissioned and sent out at the beginning of this chapter. The record of that is, is given there. And after the work in Cyprus, he went to Antioch in Pisidia, north of where he had been sent out. Paul and Barnabas in Antioch went first to the synagogue. The Jews, wherever they would be established, in any number at all, would set up a synagogue where they could worship on the Lord's Day, their Sabbath, on Saturday, of course, and when they went to the synagogue, they sat down, but they were obviously strangers. And after the law was read and a portion from the prophets, the ruler of the synagogue asked them whether either of them had anything to say, any exhortation, and Paul did. He arose and brought them the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, showing from the Old Testament scriptures, notice, how careful he was in speaking to the Jews to ground everything that he said in the Old Testament scriptures. He showed them that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, that he was the son of David, that John the Baptist had come as prophesied in the Old Testament to be a forerunner of the Messiah that the rulers put him to death, even as the prophets had foretold they would, that God raised him from the dead, even as this was recorded in Scripture. And he demonstrated that especially from the Old Testament. Until he came, finally, to verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, on the basis of all of that, be it known unto you, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you, the forgiveness of sins. And yet Paul could see that many of the Jews were skeptical not only, but they were rejecting this word of the gospel. So he gives them a warning also from the Old Testament, from the prophet Haggai in verse 41. Behold ye despisers and wonder and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. He warns them, be not the fulfillment of that Old Testament prophecy, a warning of judgment. But many of the Jews that morning did believe, and proselytes, Gentiles who had been converted to the Old Testament religion prior to this, but many did not. The demand for more preaching came particularly from the Gentiles. And Paul, therefore, and Barnabas agreed to preach to them, and the next Sunday we read almost the entire city of Antioch and Pisidia was gathered together to hear the word of the gospel, an amazing thing. And as that gathering came, and more and more citizens, so that the, almost the entire city was there, the Jews, who did not believe, were filled with envy, and they began to criticize Paul and Barnabas' word and began to blaspheme the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul had to show to them that they had declared themselves, had shown themselves to be unworthy of eternal life, and therefore, he said, we turn to the Gentiles. And then he said, but this too is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy that the Gentiles will be gathered into the church of God. And we read in verse 48, and when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And it's in that context that we read the Holy Spirit giving now to Luke the inspired writing this explanation, and as many as were ordained to eternal life, believed. The connection between this and the first part of the chapter which we considered last week is obvious to all, I am sure. God sent Paul and Barnabas out, but it was not an empty exercise. 
It was not a pointless thing to go out into the nations and begin to preach the gospel. God has his, had his elect there, but those elect had to be gathered through the preaching of the gospel, and they were gathered. And as many as were ordained to eternal life, elected in all eternity, they believed when Paul and Barnabas preached the word of the gospel. This is a glorious text, not only for missions, but for each one of us. What a blessed truth this is, that everyone that is ordained to eternal life believes. We'll consider this then under the theme, ordained believers, ordained believers. Believers, And each one of the three points has the word believing in it with a colon. Believing, first of all, who? Who are the people that believe? Secondly, believing what? What do they believe? And then thirdly, believing unto what? And that is, of course, eternal life. Ordained believers, believing who? Believing what? And believing unto what? Who believed the gospel that was preached unto them by the Apostle Paul and by Barnabas, those ordained to eternal life. That word ordained means literally to set something, to appoint something. And it implies at least two things. First of all, that some have been chosen out of a whole, that some of them has been selected and drawn out. And then secondly, they have been put, set in a particular place or a particular petition, they, position. rather. They have been ordained or set into something. This word is used, for example, in Psalm 8, where we read that God ordained the moon and the stars. He set them in their places in the heaven. They were ordained, set by God. We read in a different way in Jeremiah 1 that God ordained Jeremiah to be a prophet. He set Jeremiah in the position of being a prophet. We read in Romans 13 this word, the powers that are, are ordained by God. They have been set there by God. That's the word used in the text. Those who have been ordained to eternal life. The reference here clearly is to the doctrine of election, that God chose his people out of the mass of humanity and set them into his church. They are placed there. You get the idea here of a beautiful mosaic. You children in school, sometimes in art class, the teacher will have you make a mosaic. And sometimes the That'll be done by ripping or cutting little pieces of paper and gluing them on another piece of paper or by taking different seeds, red seeds and yellow seeds and green seeds and you draw a picture and then you paste those seeds on the paper and what comes out of it is a mosaic, is a, is a design or a picture. That's what the church is. The church is a beautiful mosaic made out of living stones that God sets into place. That's what the church is. God is the artist. And he forms a beautiful picture. And in that picture, every stone has a place. And every stone fits perfectly into the picture that God has determined for his beautiful mosaic. God chose his church. God chose each and every member of that church. And at the center of that mosaic, that beautiful picture that God makes, at the very core of that is a living stone, which is Jesus Christ. He is called in the Bible the elect of God. He is the one that is chosen first in all the counsel of God and then around that central stone of Jesus Christ are all the others that God sets perfectly into place. A glorious, perfect mosaic God makes. God set each one. That's the word ordained here. God set each one into that 
beautiful picture. This is God's work. It's evident from, and here we go with grammar again, with a passive voice. When you're passive, you're not doing anything. Someone does something to you. Well, the text indicates that when it says that they were ordained. No one came out and said, ordain me, I will do it. No, we were set, ordained by God. We were absolutely passive in this activity. God, according to His good pleasure, sets His people. And now, so unlike an artist, or our, when we're in school and we're making our mosaic in art class, where we have to make do, maybe we want a particular color, but we, we can't have it. Maybe we need a different color seed, but somebody else took them, so we ran out and we have to make do. God never has to make do. God doesn't look around and say, let me see what's the best material and I'll take what I can get here. God is the creator and he makes each one of his people that he has chosen eternally. He makes them with a personality, with the gifts, with all of the necessary qualities to fit perfectly into his glorious mosaic. It's his work. And he places them in time to mold and shape them. He places them in time in a particular home, in a particular point in history, and then eventually in that glorious mosaic in heaven. Already now we have a place in the church on earth, but ultimately a place in glory. Those who were ordained to that, who were set to eternal life, are the ones who believed. So it's not a cold number that God ordained, well, I want to get 450 quintillion people. Not a cold number, but specific individuals chosen by God to fit a particular place, set by God in all eternity. That's this as part of God's decree is plain. Once again, our English grammar here is so important. By the perfect tense. The perfect tense is something that describes something that is already happened. It, it's past. It's a finished deed. And that's the work, word in the, in the original that's used. That's the tense that is used here. It's the perfect tense. It describes something that's done already. And that's why it says they were ordained. This is an accomplished fact. This is something that God did long ago. They are already set in God's counsel, His decree. Ephesians 1 puts it this way, that we have been chosen in Jesus Christ before the foundations of the world, before God created anything. We were chosen in Jesus Christ. Same idea as the text here. This decree of God is an unchanging decree because it's part of the plan of God. And as God's mind does not change, so His plan does not change. And His mind doesn't change because God doesn't change. In school, in art class, we might decide to do the whole thing differently when we're partway finished. God does not. He sets His people. They are set eternally unchangeably. This is an all-wise decree that has made provision for everything, that as every, every stone is selected, every place where the stone is selected eternally, so that everything fits perfectly in God's beautiful work. It's a sovereign choice, not dependent on us. It isn't that God chose some because of who they were or because of what they were. God set them and formed them according to His plan. And it's a powerful plan, an efficacious plan. Whatever God has determined will happen. That raises questions, as questions always arise, between the relationship now of being elected and believing. What's the relationship between being elected by God, ordained, set, 
and the activity of believing, the relationship between the two. Does God perhaps ordain all men? That is, he wants to set them all in his beautiful mosaic, but only some make it into the mosaic? Is that possible? Or did God only set or ordain some? Secondly, if God only ordained some, then are those the only ones who believe? Is it so that only those who have been chosen, set, ordained by God, are those the only ones that believe? Or is it possible that here are the people that God ordained, but there are a larger number of people, or a smaller number of people, that actually believe? Do all those who are ordained by God actually believe? The text answers that with those three little words, and, or rather, as many as. As many as. That means there is a one-to-one correspondence between those who are ordained by God, set by God, and those who believe. A one-to-one correspondence. Let me give you a couple of examples from our life to show that that's what the word as many as means. If a boss in a restaurant makes up a schedule and he writes down all the people that he wants to come to work on a certain day and a certain shift, he expects that as many as he wrote down on the schedule will be there. None fewer, none more. If a president appoints a cabinet and he calls for a cabinet meeting, he expects that all those whom he has appointed to his cabinet will be there and no more. That's what the word as many as means no more, no fewer than those who have been selected. But not only is that true of bosses and presidents, those are human beings who cannot determine that someone might get sick or that someone didn't look at the schedule. This is God, God who sets his people exactly knows and determines that they are the ones who will believe, not more, not fewer. What about the other examples from Scripture that we talked about? God ordained the moon and the stars. Does that mean that maybe there were two moons for a little while, that more moons appeared than God ordained, or that a different moon came into the sky than the one God determined to make? He ordained the moon, and the moon that he ordained is the one that was set in the sky. And when God ordained the stars, did it happen that maybe there were more stars than what he really ordained, or that there weren't as many as he had ordained in eternity? Absolutely not. As many stars as God ordained were there exactly as large as he determined or small as he determined, exactly in the position that he determined. God ordained the moon and the stars. God ordained his people. Just as he ordained Jesus Christ. And that is his mediator. There are now two mediators It's not a different mediator than God ordained. It is Jesus Christ who is ordained to be a mediator. And all those who are in Jesus Christ and no more. It certainly isn't true that God ordained all men to eternal life. But that he accepted whoever kind of came out when he called them nor that God ordained some or many, but he'll take what he can get. God 
ordained some to er eternal life, and every one that God ordained to eternal life believes. Those are the believers in the text. And they believed as many as were ordained to that. Election is a beautiful truth of God. It is a beautiful truth not only because of the glory of the church and the order and the beauty of that church, but for us it's a beautiful thing because election is a matter of God's love. It's not a matter of a simple choice, a decree. He chose His people whom He loved. That's the beauty of it for us. He describes it that way with Israel, His chosen in Deuteronomy 14, God hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are from the earth. Literally, from all the nations. He has chosen you to be a peculiar possession. Or Amos 3, verse 2, You only, God says to Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. And knowledge in Scripture is that beautiful, intimate knowledge of love as Adam knew his wife. God knew Israel. He loved Israel. They were his peculiar possession. The same thing is true in the New Testament as, God, as Jesus describes those who are set by God, ordained by God, all those whom the Father hath given me. That's who they are. They are my sheep. I know my sheep. I love my sheep. I lay down my life for my sheep. And in fact, specifically to the Pharisees, he said, you are not my sheep. And that explains why you do not believe. That verse in John, John 10, 26, exactly is the counterpart to the text we consider as he said to the Pharisees, you're not my sheep. That's why you do not believe. My sheep, they believe, every one of them. Romans 9 goes farther. Vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Vessels of mercy who will be filled with the love and mercy of God for an eternity. Because Jacob, have I loved. I've loved him. And I still do. God is a beautiful God. And we, those who are ordained to eternal life, know that God loves them. As many as. One to one correspondence. So who are the believers? Those ordained to eternal life. But they have to believe something. You can't simply have a vague belief. You have to believe something, or you have to believe in someone. What is it that they believe? They believe the gospel. And the whole context here is the message of Paul, the gospel that he brings, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus began his public ministry that way according to Mark chapter 1, 15. There we read, the time is fulfilled, Jesus said this, and the kingdom of God is at hand, repent ye and believe the gospel. That's what he said in his public ministry. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Believing the gospel is essentially believing in Jesus Christ, and that's the most common language of Scripture. Scripture says believe in Christ, believe on Christ, believe in His name and into His name. And John wrote, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ, believes that He is the Christ, the appointed, anointed of God, shall, or rather has, eternal life, or rather is born of God. Why that? Why faith in Christ? Why not faith in the Holy Spirit? Why not faith in the Father? Why do the Scriptures emphasize you have to believe in Christ? 
the answer according to scripture is is that Christ is the revelation of God he is perfectly suited to be the revelation of God in all his glory you remember John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14, and the Word became flesh. So now we can see Him. You can't see God. God is spirit. But now the Word has become flesh. Now you can see Him. And so John writes, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and grace truth. And Paul explains in the first Corinthians, first Colossians, rather Colossians 1, in him that is in Christ dwelleth the Godhead bodily. The fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily in Jesus Christ. He is the Word, and a Word informs, a Word reveals something, but he's also in his very body the fullness of the Godhead, Jesus Christ. You must believe in Him because He is the perfect revelation of God in all His glory. He is the revelation of God not only in His glory, but as our Savior. He's Jesus, Jehovah Salvation. That's His very name appointed of God, not only to reveal God in Himself as a Savior, but to be the Savior of God, to come into the flesh, to take upon Himself the guilt of His people, to go to the cross and pay for their sins. The cross is the accomplishment of that. God sent His Son into the world to die, to die. Paul writes of that, speaks of that in this sermon that he gave here verse 38 be it known unto you therefore men and brethren that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of moses justification by faith if you do not believe in jesus you do not believe in God. But if you do believe in Jesus, you believe in God. Heidelberg Catechism, when it talks about the content of faith, what do you believe? It gives us the Apostles' Creed and all the glorious truths of the Trinity and the creation out of nothing and the work of Jesus Christ in saving us, and the Holy Spirit, and what He accomplishes. And so we might think, well, how do I put that together? This is what I have to believe according to the Catechism, but the Bible says, believe in Jesus Christ. And they come together in this. Jesus Christ is the revelation of all of that. In Him, all those things are a reality in Jesus Christ. He is the revelation of God. And now to take that one step farther. When you know and believe in Jesus Christ, you believe in Him. You embrace Him. You hold on to Him with the arms of faith. You belong to him, and he belongs to you. For what is faith, after all? It's the bond that grafts us into Jesus Christ, makes us to be a part of, a living member of the body of Jesus Christ. Faith is also that certain knowledge that everything in the Bible is true that God has revealed to us. A knowledge not merely about God, facts about God, though it is that, but a knowledge that is the knowledge of experience as a child knows his mother, knows what she likes and dislikes, knows what her personality is like, and he knows her not because he read a book about her, but because he has lived with her. So he knows his mother. This is the kind of knowledge that the believer has. He knows God. 
And he says, I know what the Scripture says is true, not only because I know God is a truthful God, and this is His Word, but I know it's true because I have experienced this. A believer knows the love of God. He knows his sins are forgiven. He knows the mercy of God and he knows eternal life. He knows it from experience. and That's why he has the confidence then to go to God. He knows that God is holy. He knows that he is a sinner. And yet, going into the presence of God, he's not terrified. He's confident he can go into God's presence and know that God will not destroy him, but that God will welcome him into his presence to enjoy covenant fellowship. Faith does that. Faith ushers us into the very presence of God. Without faith, you cannot know God. Without faith, you do not love Him, you hate Him, you flee from Him, you want nothing to do with Him. Faith brings you into His presence. And now that faith keeps on searching. What does it believe? The truth of God. And it keeps searching for the truth and seeking to know more about that God because He loves that God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, and he can't get enough knowledge of him. He wants to grow in his knowledge. He searches the Scripture. He attends the worship services. He wants to grow in his knowledge. Everyone that is ordained to eternal life receives that precious faith. Everyone. God's precious gift. That's what faith is. Philippians even says in chapter 1, For you, it is given unto you to believe in Jesus Christ. Even the activity of believing is a gift from God. And the canons of Dort therefore put the relationship between election and faith correctly. Faith is not a condition that gets you elected. It isn't that God looked ahead and saw who would believe and therefore He chose them, but quite the opposite. Faith is the, rather, election is the fountain out of which all the saving works of God flow, including faith. It's the fountain. It's the fruit of election. The text says the same thing when it says, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. If God ordains to eternal life, He works faith in them. If God does not ordain to eternal life, He does not give the gift of faith. Anyone, therefore, who has that precious gift can work backwards and say, I'm one of those eternally ordained by God to be a part of His church. The Jews, many of them rejected the gospel that Paul brought. Many of the Gentiles believed it. And the explanation for that, they were ordained to eternal life. That's the explanation. And that is the third thing, then. We are ordained unto eternal life. Eternal life is life with God. This is how Jesus describes it in John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal. This is what it is. That they might know thee, the one only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, that they might know thee. This is life eternal, to know God, to know him with the experience of faith. We sing, though the versification isn't that close to the psalm, nonetheless, it's very true and beautiful. We sing, it's altar number 300, 
rather 203, to live apart from God is death. And that's true. To live apart from God is death. God is life. God is life. He is life within Himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, living in a beautiful and glorious covenant life in all eternity. He was never lonely. He had a beautiful and glorious life within Himself. He is life. Life for us as creatures is to know that God and to be brought into the fellowship of that covenant God and to experience something of the love that God has infinitely within himself, Father, Son, and Spirit, to experience something of that love ourselves and to be swept up into that life. That is eternal life for us, to know God with the knowledge of faith, to hear him speak his words of love to us, to experience his mercy and his goodness showered upon us, to experience that, and then to respond, to live in that. Not a cold marble statue that simply gets poured out upon, but to respond to that in love, to be able to express to God our love for him that is flowing out of the love in our hearts from him originally, to express that to him, to thank him, to talk with Him, experiencing life with God. To sing His praises, that's what our life is, eternal life. A life that is possessed by the believer now. Jesus said, He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. You already have it. You already have it. We already have the beginning of covenant fellowship with God in this life, but the fullness in heaven, the fullness, where there will be no sin or death or separation or anything that now mars our friendship with God. We have a friendship, but how easily is it not disrupted by our sins and by our separation? In heaven, all of that is gone. And we possess eternal life. Our sin is gone. Death is gone. Trouble is gone. Sorrow is gone. And separation so that we will see Him face to face in Jesus Christ. The only way you can, but you will see Him face to face. This is eternal life. A life that can never die because it's the resurrection life of Jesus Christ. We are ordained to eternal life. Eternally chosen by God to have eternal life. Not ordained to the possibility, not that God selects a group of people and they have a better chance of getting it. No, we are ordained to it. Into it, literally, in the, in the original. We are ordained, set into life everlasting. What a comfort, what a comfort to know that our salvation is that secure. God doesn't ordain many and then see who makes it. If God does that, then I have no assurance because many obviously fail. But when I read that as many as, then I understand. My salvation is absolutely steadfast and secure. But what an encouragement also to the church of Jesus Christ to be faithful in mission work, to send out missionaries, because God will save His church. It doesn't depend on us. It doesn't depend either, though the minister tries, obviously, as Paul did, to have a sermon appropriate to the audience. But the saving of the people doesn't depend on that. It isn't as if, well, now we send Reverend Lanning off to Singapore, and only if he does a really superb job will God bless his work. Absolutely not. Of course he is called to faithfulness. But God gathers his church. It doesn't depend on us. We just simply have to be faithful. 
all those whom God has ordained to eternal life do believe, absolutely, in every nation, wherever God sends his preaching. In fact, so important is this to God that Jesus Christ cannot and will not come on the clouds of heaven until every one of those ordained to eternal life has believed. Has believed. This is God's eternal plan. To gather his church out of all the nations, not only longer out of the Jews, but clearly out of all the nations. What an incentive for us to be faithful. God's promise. May God grant us that joy in our salvation and that diligence in sending forth the gospel. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word of truth. What a glorious truth thou hast impressed upon thy word and in our hearts and souls. We rejoice in thee, for our hope is only in thee and not at all in ourselves. Continue, therefore, Lord, to gather thy church that thou hast chosen in all eternity. Send forth thy word, and be pleased to use us to send forth that word. For Jesus' sake, amen.